Welcome to EL Civics Basics, Civic Participation, and IELCE requirements. I'm Lori Howard, CASA's Program Specialist Coordinator, and I'm excited to present this information to you today. Our goals and objectives for today are at the end of this session, you'll be able to identify the requirements of the California WIOA Title II AFLA EL Civics Grant specific to civic participation and IELCE. And whether you're an administrator, a coordinator of EL Civics, a teacher of EL Civics, um, you'll get a lot out of this session. Uh, there's a lot of information on the slides. I hope you, you'll download the slides to your desktop so that you have it for reference. Um, again, there's a lot of information, but um, you may have to hear it more than once, but you can always come back to this webinar to view it. So before we start, I'd like you to do a little bit of a self-assessment. How would you characterize your understanding of civic participation and IELCE? on a piece of paper, a scrap of paper near you, rate yourself from one to five. Would you say one, I don't know much, or somewhere in the middle, or number five, you're an expert. Just take a second to rate yourself from one to five. At the end of the session, I'll have you rate yourself again and we'll see how much you've grown in terms of your knowledge of civic participation and IELCE. So let's talk about California EL Civics. Um, what is it? Okay, California EL English Literacy and Civics Education promotes the development of integrated programs that incorporate English language and literacy instruction, which we call ESL, and civics education. The civics education is sort of a broad definition of civics, not just about government, but about the community in general. EL Civics is funded by uh, AFLA and WIOA. It's um, started out in 1999 of the AFLA, the AFLA Adult Education and Family Literacy Act. Um, and then in 2014, it was reauthorized and became the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act Title II, uh, WIOA Title II. The 2014 grant changed the name from EL Civics to integrated EL Civics, but most people know it as EL Civics, so I'm going to refer to it today uh, as EL Civics. So WIOA 2 defines English literacy and civics education as education services, which enable competency in English language, most of all, and then advanced skills needed to function effectively as parents, workers, and citizens in the United States. <clears throat> it includes instruction in literacy and English language acquisition, rights and responsibilities of citizenship and civic participation, and it may include workforce training. Workforce training was always a part of the original grant, but the 2014 version emphasized workforce training and gave new funds for that training, and we'll talk about that. So, California EL Civics has three focus areas uh, and EL Civics agencies can hold classes in one or more focus areas depending on their funding. So if you have 231 funding, you can uh, do citizenship preparation with your students. If you have 231 funding, you can do civic participation. And then if you applied for the 243 funding, that's IELCE. So you have to check your funding and make sure what kind you have so you know um, the requirements for each. But the reason we've put them together in this webinar is that the basic requirements for both civic participation and IELCE are exactly the same. Citizenship preparation is different and there's an EL Civics basic citizenship preparation webinar you can attend. We won't be talking any more about citizenship preparation in this webinar. So we're going to talk about civic participation, again, 231 funded, and IELCE, 243 funded programs. So California EL Civics, Civic Participation and IELCE was a great boon to California ESL. It gave us the opportunity to build on our competency-based education system, uh, CBE, and connect what we were teaching to the students to the real world. 
And we did that through uh, our co-app system and utilizing a performance-based assessment to evaluate how learners could use the language in a real life setting and how measure their success in the community. And also with the new funding, connect English learners to the workplace, those IELCE funds. So our EL Civic Civic Participation and IELCE system is based on a system of civic objectives and civic objectives and additional assessment plans. That's a mouthful, so we call that co-ops. So at the top, you can see here civic objectives, we sometimes abbreviate it as CO. They're the general competencies that help students access their community. So for example, we have a, a civic objective 33, which is in the area of employment. And it says, identify and access employment and training resources to obtain and keep a job. You can see that there would be many, many um, language and literacy objectives or more specific classroom objectives that would relate to this very general civic objective. Uh, along with our civic objectives, we have, again, the civic objectives and additional assessment plans, co-apps. And a co-app is a plan for performance-based assessment. It's not the assessment itself, it's just the plan. Uh, so for example, uh, tasks in a performance-based assessment might be complete a job application, demonstrate successful job interview techniques. You can see that they're very real life based things. We're trying to help students access the community by preparing them and then assessing them in a real life task. So civic participation and IELC have requirements. The first six are for both programs, civic participation and IELCE. And the seventh one is for 243 programs only, IELCE only, okay? We're gonna talk about each one of these six items or seven items step-by-step, step, and then we'll do a little review at the end. That is the bulk of what we're doing today. So the first one, develop and administer a school community student needs assessment. So as we know, successful programs continually assess the needs, interests, and language skills of their learners by conducting ongoing needs assessments. So you probably were doing this already, but this grant requires it that you uh, survey your total school community. And the requirements are to develop and administer a school community needs assessment, so some kind of um, uh, instrument, and many agencies now are doing this uh, online with SurveyMonkey or other uh, apps. And then once you finish the uh, ass assessment itself, then you need to complete the needs assessment summary form and keep it on file at your agency. So when a CD regional consultant might ask you for that, you would have it on file. Also, um, I'd like you to read the school community needs assessment uh, requirement for integrated EL civics during the COVID-19 pandemic because there's some extra information about needs assessment there. Okay, so let's talk about the needs assessment. We have basically two kinds of needs assessment. The first one is a general needs assessment and that's the one you've been doing for a long time. And if you have 231 funds only, that's all you'll do. So you're going to assess the needs of the school community as a whole, and those are the students, and you'll be asking them basically what EL Civics information they need and want to learn. And you're going to give them some options. If you have 243 funds, you're going to also include or add on separately uh, workforce training needs assessment. Uh, and that would ask or get the information for which career pathways do students want to follow. Uh, and English language learners who wish to gain the training uh, and employment should be given this specifically designed needs assessment. And then optionally, once you've chosen um, your civic objectives and additional assessment plans that come out of the needs assessment, you might wanna do an optional classroom needs assessment to say, we've chosen these six co-ops, you know, which of these six do you want to do? So that's a further assessment of a specific class you can do once classes begin. Um, so let's talk about how to develop a school community needs assessment. So you wanna choose 
approximately, and this is up to you, two to four civic objectives from each of the six competency areas on the pre-approved objectives list. And I wanna mention that everything that's underlined here is a link to a place on the EL Civics Civic Participation and IELCE webpage. And there's a wealth of information there. So uh, once this session is over, you can uh, download this to a PDF on your desktop, and then you can link to all of these items. This document has all of the civic objectives and their corresponding um, language and literacy objectives. So there are six main and general uh, areas of civic objectives. Those are called competency areas. They are in consumer economics, community resources, health, government and law, transition, and employment. And so you're going to take two to four of the civic objectives in those areas. And that the reason for that is to give students a wide breadth of uh, possibilities. They may not choose anything in transition or in government and law, but you should offer it so that you really are surveying the needs of the learners. The needs assessment will include then, if you do two to four, then they'll include uh, approximately 12 to 24 civic objectives that you're offering students. And again, you can um, limit the number depending on the level of the student. So certainly a beginning level student might be overwhelmed by seeing 24 items. So you might wanna offer them 12, that's up to you. And so I just want to show you some more sample civic objectives so you can get an idea of the kinds of things you might be offering in each of the areas. So in consumer economics, uh, we have uh, access community commercial agencies to resolve a consumer com complaint. In health, CO26 is about healthcare services. Um, government and law, 45, about the individual rights and laws and ordinances, as well as obtaining legal help. In Transition 52, a very popular co-op about soft skills and uh, learning leadership skills, very important in all of our classes and also in workforce training. And then specifically to workforce training, this one is about uh, early childhood education. So there's a lot of options here. So um, you want to use the chosen civic objectives to design a needs assessment. And, Remember that beginning level learners are gonna need a picture-based assessment tool with perhaps some simplified words and then intermediate to advanced level students should also have pictures um, and they can have phrases or sentences as well. Remember that the civic objective description I just showed you uh, in the previous slide are not appropriate to show your students. Those are for teachers only. So for example, we want you to do this, have a collage of pictures and then use a bank for your beginning level students. And then again, not this, we don't want you to uh, use the civic objective itself, too complex for our students. And okay, once you've developed your school community student needs assessment, then you want to administer it. So you want to administer it to a majority of your learners. We realize you might not be able to get everyone, but you want to try to get as many people as possible. The easiest way to do it is to give them, again, the assessment and ask them to X out or check their, or on a computer check, their three to five top objectives. You don't need them to do it in rank order. That just complicates things. So I would just have them check their three to five. And then you tally the results of, using the number that you want to get in the end. So tally with the results, you wanna end up with three co-ops or you wanna end up with five, then you choose the top three or the top five. You have the opportunity to choose from beginning three to 10 civic objectives per year. We'll talk more about that. So once you have the civic objectives, you wanna to go to that pre-approved civic objective list. Oh, I'm sorry, you want to go to, um, look at the different co-ops on the CASAS website and uh, review all the possible co-ops within the civic objective to decide which one meets the needs of your students. Then you'll select the co-op that meets the needs and perhaps the also meets the type of assessment you want, either oral or written, and the level of your students. For example, some co-ops are not for all levels. Um, and once you've selected your co-ops, then you complete the needs assessment summary form. You summarize the process you went through. You attach a copy of the needs assessment or assessments that you've included or a link to them. And then uh, you 
uh, talk about the results. Which co-ops did you choose as a result of your needs assessment? So if you're an IELCE 243 program, you'll want to add another needs assessment. <clears throat> and in this case, it's a little bit different. And you may have already done some of these things, but the first thing that needs to happen in workplace training is to survey the community for job opportunities. We don't want to train students for jobs that are not out there in our communities. So survey your community. And again, your CTE, Career Technical Education Program, may have already done this. <clears throat> But then you want to decide which training your agency or partner agencies can offer and then, and then work with them to see which ones would accept um, English language learners um, if they were supported with English language support training. Um, so once you have that list of training that you can offer or do already offer, then you want to develop a needs assessment related to those jobs that you can offer. You're going to administer the assessment to the learners interested in job training who are in your IELCE program. And then you utilize that to select existing co-ops uh, or create new ones. So we uh, greatly encourage you to create new co-ops to fit the needs of your students in these IELCE programs. The ones we already have for specific training are accounting, building and construction, early childhood education, information technology, healthcare, and manufacturing. And uh, our EL Civic staff would love to assist you to create new co-ops. Or again, you can use the more general ones like 33, employment, or 52, like I talked about a minute ago, the soft skills. Again, you'll want to complete the needs assessment summary form. Um, it's either in addition to your general assessment, or if you're only an IELCE program, then you'll be submitting or keeping your own needs assessment summary form for the IELCE program. Okay, once you've uh, chosen the co-ops that you're going to um, utilize with your agency, then you need to select them on the CASAS website. Okay, so just to review, the needs assessment results from inform the selection of your co-ops. And then um, agencies use each co-op or plan to develop an assessment to uh, give learners uh, after 30 hours of instruction in content that's specifically related to the co-op. As I mentioned earlier, agencies are required to select three to 10 co-ops. And if you're selecting fewer than three or more than 10, you must request permission from your CDE regional consultant. And once you've requested uh, permission for a certain number, uh, that number uh, stays year after year until you decide to lower it or raise it. Okay, talking about co-ops. So there are, multiple, there are multiple assessment plans or co-ops for each civic objective. Just a little information about the co-ops. Each co-op is numbered and the first number corresponds to the civic objective. So number one is civic objective one. The second number after the point designates individual assessment plans related to the civic objective. So we have 1.4 and 1.5. They're two assessment plans that uh, go along with civic objective one. Each plan includes assessment tasks learners must complete to demonstrate what they've learned. And they usually include two tasks for each level of learner uh, and portfolio assessments have, have more tasks. So you want to, after you've done your needs assessment, select co-ops that most closely match the needs of your learners and your program. And then you wanna consider the type of assessment related to the language skills. So do you wanna select uh, an oral task, a written task, a role play? And then you also wanna consider the content. So for example, in objective nine, locate and analyze preschool and childcare services. There are two co-ops, 9.3 is all written. So that might be easier for your agency to do, or uh, in this, these days of remote instruction, it might be better to implement oral tasks. So 9.3 is written. And uh, it includes characteristics of good quality childcare and evaluating a facility. And then 9.4 includes both an oral and written tasks. In that one, they would compare child care facilities and then present an oral report on child care agencies. 
So after selecting co-op, we're going to move to requirements three and four. Three is develop or borrow a performance-based assessment based on the selected co-op. And four is then um, uh, develop uh, 30 hours of instruction. So first you develop the assessment and then you develop the instruction. So let's talk about those two requirements. So the first one again, uh, well, let's before we get there, let's talk about the kinds of assessment a co-op is. As I mentioned earlier, we are dealing with performance-based assessment. So here's a definition from Chun about what is performance-based assessment. It measures students' ability to apply the skills and knowledge learned from a unit or units of study. This is not a paper and pencil test as we usually think of them. It's not a standardized test. It's a test that you write for your students to show how they can apply their skills. <coughs> Excuse me. And it should challenge the students to use their higher order thinking skills to create a product or complete a process. So it's all about the application of skills. So you, based on the co-op you've selected, you want to develop, or you can borrow additional assessments. If you're new to EL Civics, it would be probably good for you to borrow, at least to look at something to model after, okay? But um, you're charged with developing or borrowing using someone else's additional assessment. Again, it's not a standardized test. It's one that your agency or another agency make up. And these additional assessments are, as I mentioned, performance-based. They assess how well a learner can interact or access the community. And they directly relate to the co-op. So the assessment has to follow the plan. Uh, and they include tasks that learners must perform in real life. So whenever you question about what you're doing in, in the co-ops and your tasks, always think about what a native speaker in real life do this thing. That's how we want to uh, look at these performance-based assessments because we're hoping to encourage our students to toward native speaker-like performance. And then does the uh, additional assessment relate to instruction in topic and instruction type. Okay, so it has to have the information of the co uh, suggested in the co op and then the instruction type, oral, written, uh, listening, or reading. Some things to avoid because your assessments may not have these things. You can't use true false questions. You can't use multiple choice questions. You can't use real, what we usually consider as fill in questions like fill in the blank or usually uh, a closed type, although sometimes that's used for a uh, very low level students. Of course, you can have them fill out applications. So don't confuse that with what I'm talking about here as a fill in question. Uh, we don't allow matching. And we don't allow text boxes, which give uh, possible answers and have students choose the correct one from a text box. Again, we're trying to encourage students to be able to do these tasks in their real life. And they wouldn't have these assistances when they um, go out in the real world. So whatever a native speaker would take out in the real world with them um, can be used as part of the assessment, but nothing else. So be careful of these. Uh, ones that are not allowed. Okay, so again, you develop your agency's assessments based on the co-op selected. You can use other agencies' excellent assessments as a model. Again, if you borrow someone else's, make sure to look it over. Uh, just because someone else is using it doesn't mean it's exactly right. So be sure, or that it meets the needs of your students. So um, be sure you check something out if you borrow it. Um, the way to borrow it and you, is to find other agencies who've selected the same co-op that you did and ask to borrow their instructional materials. And you can find a list of those agencies and what they've selected at on the uh, Civic Participation and ILC webpage at the CASAS website. And it's called Co-op Selected by California Agencies. So for example, um, 47.2, uh, developed by Torrance Adult School. Um, you can find the instructional materials for it at this Weebly site here that I've listed for you. <clears throat> and then once you've looked at the instructional materials to see if you think they meet the needs of your students, then you can request um, the assessment. Really important to keep it secure and not use it for instruction because these are what we call high stakes assessments. Agencies are earning payment points um, 
for when students pass these assessments. So we need to keep the assessments secure. So be sure if you're borrowing an assessment to keep it secure. Okay, we're to four. So once you develop your assessment, then you can develop the instructional materials that will lead the student to be able to pass the assessment. Performance-based assessment, um, in performance-based assessment, you teach to the test. Um, so you're developing the instruction. Um, so civic participation and ILCE instruction prepares beginning low and advanced level learners to access the community. Um, so it's important that you know that, it, that um, Yale Civics programs are only for beginning low to advanced level learners, but literacy students uh, below that score below 180 on the CASAS test can um, participate in instruction and assessment, but they will, but you, they cannot earn a payment point until they get a score of uh, 180 or above. Okay, let's talk about the instruction that's necessary. Um, it must include all four language skills. So it may be a written assessment, but you will be talking to students, perhaps having them discuss before they actually write whatever the assessment task is. So we always include all four language skills because we want to develop all the language skills of our students. Um, and remember, it's not limited to the language and literacy objectives listed in the COAP. The COAP has the language and literacy objectives that relate directly to the task. We've tried to limit that to two or three objectives. But in order to fill out your 30 hours of instruction needed, um, you can look at the uh, pre-approved civic objectives list for many other language and literacy objectives you can use in the classroom to add to and embellish um, what's required in the co-op tasks. And remember that the 30 hours of instruction that are required can include regular classroom instruction. So if you're doing a, a, a unit on health and then in your regular ESL textbook and you have an EL Civics co-op that's on health, many of the hours for those 30 hours will be part of that general instruction. And then you'll overlay whatever extra needs to be taught in order to pass the uh, co-op test. Okay, so here are the agency options again to um, review. Um, like the assessments, you need to develop a 30 hour instructional plan which will prepare the learners to take and pass the assessment. Again, just like in the assessment, you can borrow those instructional materials. Again, as I mentioned, you can find those instructional materials that Torrance developed uh, at this Weebly site. So either the agency can develop 30 hours of instructional materials, very often they put them in a binder and hand it to teachers, or you can borrow those same materials and hand it to your teachers, or you can rely on individual instructors to plan the 30 hours of instruction in their own classes, utilizing their textbook and supplementary materials. And you can find some supplementary uh, lessons on the OTAN site, uh, www.otan.us. And uh, just to give you some information about the future. Uh, in uh, program year 2021, we will have a EL Civics instructional materials exchange where agencies and uh, teachers will be able to um, submit their instructional materials and others can go in there and find them and use those instructional materials. It's not ready yet, but OTAN and CASAS are collaborating on this uh, EL Civics exchange and uh, we hope you will like it when it's in force. Okay, now we're to um, Roman numeral five, administer additional assessments. Additional assessments can be administered after 30 hours of specific co-op related instruction. So, uh, and this is not seat time of the student, it is instruction time. The assessment can be administered by an outside assessor or the classroom instructor. If you're doing an oral assessment, it's preferable to use an outside assessor, the teacher next door, for example, because our own students are used to um, how we speak and find it easier. We're trying to prepare students to uh, deal in the outside world, outside of our classroom. So an outside assessor can um, simulate more what's going to happen outside the classroom. But a classroom instructor is 
uh, perfectly fine to give the assessment, uh, be it oral or written. And then uh, also want you to know that if a student doesn't pass, um, they can, after appropriate instruction, take the assessment again. We usually expect about 80% of students to um, pass an assessment. And again, that's a way to measure the efficacy of your um, assessment. If 100% pass, your assessment is too easy. If only 50% pass, your assessment is too difficult. So try to gauge your assessment so that 80 to 85% will pass and then offer um, extra instruction to those who don't pass and then give them the assessment again. And there are places in TE for you to mark a, a pass or fail first and then a second after uh, another pass after fa a failing test. I just want to remind you that the additional assessments must be given to individuals. There are no group assessments. So if you're doing an oral interview or a role play, the assessor, the teacher, is doing the role play with the student. There's never student to student interaction acceptable as part of a co-op assessment. <clears throat> and, but so written listening and oral report assessments can be done in a group setting but each student in that setting will be um, evaluated individually. So make sure of that. Requirement number six is CASAS testing. Um, all civic participation and IELCE students must take a CASAS pre-test and post-test pre-test to measure their skills upon entry and then a post-test to measure improvement. And um, payment points that any student earns will not count unless you have both a pre and post-test pair. Along with that, staff must complete an entry record or the equivalent for the, each learner and an update record or the equivalent for each learner again. And um, if you want to know more about CASAS testing, one person from each um, agency is required by the CDE to take CASAS test implementation training and then share that information with your um, staff. So um, make sure someone has done that and um, know that you know how to offer CASAS testing. Let's talk a little bit about um, payment points. So. Uh, Students um, need to take both a pre and a post test. They don't need to make a gain, but if they do, they can get uh, one payment point for completing a level. And then students uh, who've taken both the pre and post test can earn a payment point for each additional assessment pass up to six. So students can earn a maximum of six payment points per year. Um, three from 231 funds and three from 243 funds. And there is a civic objective list that um, shows you which of them are 231 and which are 243. Basically all co-ops are 231 and there are uh, 29 that are uh, funded for 243. If you're in a 243 IELCE program, you must use ones that are designated for 243 funding. And again, the note at the bottom that each student must have uh, an outcome data set uh, in order to earn co-op payment points. Last but not least, and then again, only for IELCE agencies, a report is due. This year it's a little, it's new. It's called the SIP, um, the Continuous Improvement Plan. And as part of the Continuous Improvement Plan, IELCE agencies need to um, complete a report. It's called the Integrated EL Civics Education or IELCE Plan. And again, it's for 243 agencies only. That plan is due on April 30th of each program year. Okay, so we've come to the end of our seven requirements and we're just gonna review them briefly. Uh, again, the first one, school community needs assessment that you need to develop it and um, keep a needs assessment summary form on file. You need to select uh, three to 10 co-ops based on that assessment that you gave. Then you develop or borrow additional assessments um, for each of the co-ops that you've selected. 
you develop the instruction or again, borrow it, and you need to offer a minimum of 30 hours of instruction. And remember that that uh, instruction needs to be specific to the content of the co-op you've selected. Then you administer the additional assessment. You make sure that students have taken both a pre and post CASAS test. And then for IELCE 243 agencies only, complete a report, the uh, continuous improvement uh, plan report uh, that's due April 30th of each program year. So let's talk about a little more about the selection process. So as we've mentioned, co-ops must be selected on the CASAS EL Civics Civic Participation and IELCE webpage. And you can find it at a link right here. Um, after selection, co-ops must be downloaded into TE. And there are instructions for that also on the uh, Civic Participation and IELCE webpage. And you find the link here. There are three types of co-ops that you can select. Okay, option one, option two, or option three, and we're going to talk about those specifically. So option one is the one most agencies use. It's for pre-approved co-ops. That means once you go into the uh, CASAS website, the um, civic participation and IELC page and find uh, the selection process, um, you, and you select it, then it's pre-approved. You can go ahead and start using it right away. Um, so this slide describes the civic objective and co-op system. So we've mentioned before civic objectives and just to give you a little bit more information about them, there are currently 59 civic objectives. And I just wanna say this is a dynamic system. So we are adding things all the time. And if you have an idea to add a new civic objective, we would love to hear it. So you can uh, contact us at elcivics at casas.org. Um, of the 59 uh, objectives, they are numbered one to 54. And then we skip some numbers for the workplace just to give some room. And uh, from 70 to 75 are the workplace training um, civic objectives. And number four happens to be deleted, 41, sorry. <clears throat> so all, as I mentioned, all 59 civic objectives can be used for 231 funding and 29 of them have been designated for 243 funding. and. Um, you can find a list of those at um, the 231 and 243 funded civic objectives list that you can link to right here. Again, talking about the co-ops, there are multiple co-ops for each civic objective. And in total, there are 164. And you can find a list of those and be able to review them at the pre-approved additional assessment plan list, again, on the civic participation and IELCE webpage. Option two, option two is for revision. So again, this is a dynamic system. So let's say you are looking at the co-ops co in uh, Civic Objective 33, but nothing exactly meets your students' needs. You can go through a process of revision and this is how you do it. You look at all the ones in your uh, of Civic Objective, all the co-ops in the Civic Objective, and you can look at other ones too to find appropriate tasks for your learners. Um, and make sure that um, you can also write new tasks as well. And, but make sure whichever tasks you choose or write new ones that they are challenging to the level of the student. That's very important. And what you need to do is write a brief description of the proposed revisions. You know, task one, I wanna do this. Task two, I wanna do that. And you submit it to elcivics at casas.org. And then, um, the uh, EL Civic staff will review your proposal and get back to you about how you might change it or what needs to happen. Once the proposal is, is approved, uh, the agency writes or revises the task with the assistance from CASAS EL Civic staff, staff. So don't feel alone. We're here to support you and help you, especially in writing uh, or looking at how, which rubrics you should choose and how to figure out your rating scale. What you need to focus on is just the content. That's the most important thing you need to focus on. And if you revise a co-op for your own agency, um, remember to select it every year, even if that kicks your 
number from 10 to 11. You need to ask permission, but you need to select it every year, whether or not you're going to use it. That keeps it in the system. These days, um, agencies haven't been necessarily using those co-ops uh, for their own agencies. When they submit them, we often realize that they would be good for the whole state. So we often make them pre-approved. So if you want to revise something, it may end up being used by agencies all over the state. Again, this is a dynamic system. Option three is for new co-ops. Um, we can't always anticipate the needs of our students. This program started in California in 2000, so it's been 20 years. And over that time, um, we've added new co-ops. So everything after 45, the first 45 were done in the year 2005, I think. And then since 2005, we've added a number of co-ops. We've added um, nutrition, we've added um, information technology or digital literacy. Uh, we've added the transition co-ops, uh, leadership skills, et cetera. And then we added one for the census that was used uh, last year during the census time. So there's always room for new ideas. So please um, submit any new ideas you have. And um, again, you follow the same process really as for the revision. You uh, write a brief description of the proposed co-op and then go through the approval process. Um, and again, those, oh, that should say option three co-ops must be selected um, each year. Those last two bullets should say option three. Agency submits revised co-op into option three on the EL Civics co-op selection webpage and option three co-ops must be selected each year to keep them live in the system. Okay, again, the co-op selection process. Agencies may select three to 10 co-ops. If you're wishing to select more than 10 or fewer than three, you need to uh, contact your CDE regional consultant. You can find them at the CDE regional consultant list, again, on the CASAS website. And also know that you need to be designated as ELC primary or ELC secondary to submit co-ops into the submission system. If you're not designated, you won't have access to that uh, selection process. So if you wanna have access or your agency wants you to have access, your principal or coordinator should send your name into your CASAS program specialist. Um, and you can also find a list of those on the CASAS website. Um, to report any changes to the context or to add your name. Here are the submission deadlines for the current program year. Um, and this is every year. So all, all options, whatever you're choosing, you must select one by October 31st of the program year. This is just to make sure that you can access the system and you're ready to make your selections. So that's the first requirement of the year on October 31st. Then you have from October 31st all the way through April 30th to uh, submit your option one or option two co-ops. Again, if you're revising though, be sure uh, you should start revising by March 1st at the very latest so that there's a month at least to be working on uh, getting the co-op ready to select. Okay, so give us at least a month ahead of this April 30th deadline. Option three, because it's, you're working with new co-ops, we ask for a submission deadline of the 31st of January. And again, you need to start working on that earlier so CASA staff have the opportunity to work with you. So I would say um, by December 1st would be a good time to be submitting your proposal for an option three uh, co-op so that it will be um, sure to get approved by the, uh, January 31st. And as we come to a close, I'd like to say that Yale Civics has really had a lot of success. Um, analyses of data, CASAS data over several years show that students enrolled in civic participation and IELCE really have more chance of persisting and achieving a higher percent of learner completions than those in ESL only. And we think it's related in part to our needs assessment. We are serving our students needs and so they are persisting coming back to class over and over again because they're learning what they want to learn. Um, you should review your local agency data to identify your own areas of success after you begin your um, civic participation or IELCE program. 
So now we're going to talk a little bit about Yale Civics resources because we want to make sure you have all the information you need to implement your civic participation and IELCE programs. So you can find all the information you need on the civic participation and IELCE webpage at www.casas.org. This link will take you there. So you should really peruse that page. And there is a webinar, CASAS Website Basics for EL Civics is, on, uh, is available to you. And that will point out each of the um, pages that I mentioned today and all the information on the website and web pages that will assist you in knowing more about EL Civics. Um, also, there's a second uh, EL Civics Basics uh, called Understanding, Implementing, and Revising Co-apps. We just did an overview today of the co-app system, but this webinar will uh, go much more in depth. And last, in EL Civics Basics, Citizenship Preparation, we just touched on it today, but uh, here you will have a complete description of citizenship preparation and all the rules and regulations that go along with that. Um, also, uh, one document, there's lots of great documents on the um, web page, but one of them you for sure want to look at is the Civic Participation and IELCE FAQs. Over the years, all the questions that have been asked um, are answered there in this document. And everything on the CASAS website is updated every year as of July 1st. So you'll see uh, only new information on the website and anything that's particularly newer that happened after July 1st will be written in green so that you can say, oh, this is new information. And I also want to let you know that we do have EL Civics Network meetings. It's a Q&A format. I, um, I do usually uh, offer some any kind of new information. We often have agency sharing. Um, and then um, uh, we have a Q&A session. Those meetings are held monthly. And you can get on the mailing list at elcivics.casas.org and register for those monthly meetings at the uh, California Adult Ed Training website. Also, if you have questions, remember that your CDE regional consultants are those who deal with policy and fiscal issues. So if you have policy and fiscal questions, you should contact your CDE regional consultant. If you have instruction, assessment, or data collection questions, you should talk to your CASAS program specialist. And you have, if you have specific EL Civics questions, uh, you can write to elcivics at casas.org or to me, Lori Howard, lbhoward at casas.org. Um, and remember, again, this uh, California Civic Participation and IELCE webpage has all the information you could possibly need. Okay, we've come to the end of our session. Uh, our goal was the that you would be able to identify the requirements of the California WIOA Title II AFLA Yale Civics Grant, specific to civic participation and IELCE. I put a red check mark there because we've given you all the information and I hope that's been helpful to you. As we end, I just want to go back to your self-assessment. Would you now, a little bit lower on your piece of paper, would you characterize your understanding of civic participation and IELCE? Rate yourself from one to five. Do you still not know much? Or are you an expert or somewhere in between? Please note that and note um, how much you've learned during this time. Again, this is a lot of information. You may want to review or re-look at this uh, webinar. Um, certainly download the slides, review them. If you have any questions, uh, contact me at lbhoward.casas.org or at elcivics.casas.org. Um, I'd like you to reflect what you'll do with the information you learned. I uh, hope you won't just keep it to yourself. I hope you'll share it with your administrators, teachers, TOPS Pro Enterprise staff, and others on your campus so that all of you have a good understanding of the requirements of civic participation and IELCE. Thank you so much for attending. Again, my name, Lori Howard, my email address, my uh, phone number. I'd be happy to help you if you have questions on EL Civics, especially civic participation and IELCE. Thanks a lot.